Thanks very much, Oliver. Uh, so really, I suppose what I wanted to look at is kind of look through the prism of royal landscapes, uh, the nature of kingship in early medieval Ireland. I don't really want to focus on a particular landscape, but try and take royal sites kind of broadly defined and the sort of nexus of different types and different orders of royal landscapes and how they worked together to create and, and maintain kingdoms. Um, and really what I want to kind of emphasize is that the necessity of looking at how these changed and their importance changed over, over time in Ireland, something which I think we've, we've generally neglected. Um, so uh, kingship in Ireland is, is really famous for its sort of idiosyncrasies, really. It's famously sort of characterized as a sort of Celtic kingship and priestly vegetables was a, a memorable term used by a historian to, des to describe the characteristics of it. And really what that is, is that th that idea emphasizes the idea that Irish kings really weren't kings, they were just priests, that they were sacral entities. Um, so fa famously Irish kingship is kind of characterized as lacking the developed governmental apparatus of kind of Eastern British and continental polities, sort of Germanic kingship for want of a better term, and that Irish kings didn't legislate, they didn't have a, a system of villa regalis, or Villa Regia, um, they didn't um, really have any sort of governmental dimension. And this is something I think which is really problematic. Um, archaeologists have really tended to perpetuate that, 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 um, that anachronistic view, really, by focusing uh, correspondingly in studies of royal landscapes on things like ceremony and ideology and applying sort of phenomenological analysis to royal sites as opposed to, to kind of thinking about other ways of looking at them. So f famously sort of studies of Irish kingship have kind of tried to reconstruct a sort of pristine Indo-European ideology of kingship um, and highlighted, um, you know, very pertinent and very appropriate similarities between kingship and rituals in Ireland and uh, the kingship rituals associated with, for instance, Tara and places in, in Vedic India and the sort of Ashmavedva ritual of paramount kingship. And, you know, while these are very appropriate analogies and well-researched and everything, I would question the, the sort of appropriateness of, the, of that ideology to the experience experience and understanding of early medieval polities in Ireland. Did they really think this was a sort of archaic ritual? Did they see it in the sort of pristine manner in which it's often presented? Um, and really, I suppose, I think the question that we've been failing to ask through analysis of royal landscapes is what did polities actually do? And that's a very fundamental aspect of them. So that sort of insular, anachronistic and idiosyncratic view of Irish kingship contrasts really with the, the archaeology, where things like elite culture and the sort of quintessential characteristics of elite culture in Ireland and Western and Northern Britain are things like zoomorphic penannular brooches, which are really derived from a sort of Roman type of legitimate ador dress adornment or late Roman type of adornment. Things like beware, which as Gordon showed earlier, comes from sort of the, the, the late antique world of, of the Mediterranean. And I suppose the other kind of quintessential characteristic is, is sort of fortified sites. And cashel is, is the example I have there on the top left. And the word cashel itself is a derivative of, of Latin castellum. And this really sort of highlights a sort of late end Latinity. So in the 5th and 6th century, the quintessential characteristics of elite culture in Ireland and indeed Western Britain are really sort of late antique as opposed to, 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 to insular. And I think that's an important context that, that's not really often, um, a wider context that's not really often brought to bear on the study of the, the subject. And so in terms of the nature and function of, of royal landscapes, we've generally tended to treat, treat them in Ireland as kind of generic entities. So we've seen the as functions of assembly and inauguration and a royal caput all rolled into one invested in a single place, like for instance Tara. But it's actually, it, it's, it's incorrect to refer to somewhere like Tara as an assembly place. It was never an assembly place at any point in the early medieval period. Um, really what, what we should be doing is looking for assembly places more generally um, and trying to develop a sort of wider corpus of them. These are kind of distinctive sites and Oliver's work in Scotland has really put Scotland on the map in that respect, but we've, we've kind of lagged behind in Ireland to so have a sort of critical understanding of what an assembly place is. Generally what we find in Ireland is actually that um, we find these, these functions of assembly inauguration and royal caput actually vested in distinct locales within particular landscapes. Um, and in within sort of an estate structure. So for instance, the example I have on the bottom there is Dunseverick, the sort of royal capital of, of the kingdom of Dalryda in County Antrim. And just south of Dunseverick, Croke Moor, there is the, the place of inauguration, whereas Noxogi at the end of White Park Bay to the, to the east is a, is a place of assembly. So this is a royal landscape spread over about five or six kilometers, very extensive estate, um, royal estate, and a, a sort of polyfocal one. And that's, that's a sort of important context for these sites.
Um, but really, the sort of the, 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 the miasma, really, as I see it in terms of the study of kingship and the role of royal sites, is really the sort of perpetuation of this idea of a provincial structure um, of early early medieval Ireland as a sort of um, an immutable and archaic structure. So the, the argument really goes that uh, Ireland was developed or was divided into five provinces in uh, later prehistory, which had sort of ceremonial capitals in the prehistoric period, and that these remained the basic structuring principle of early Irish ter territoriality throughout the early medieval period, even though we don't actually have any evidence that there was ever a provincial structure in Ireland between about the 5th century and the 8th century. The problem is, is that the, pro the five-fold provincial structure is seen to be an a, a prehistoric entity because of the fact that these major provincial capitals are generally, in an archaeological sense, prehistoric ritual landscapes. Um, but as we've tended to locate more recently the sort of medieval archaeology within these landscapes and see that they continue to be used during the medieval period, that structure has become increasingly un un untenable. Other major problems really pertain to the fact that while we have five provinces, we have six royal sites. So it doesn't really pan out when you try and try and map it out. Um, and really Munster, which I've done a, a few studies of, is really the, the, the nail in the coffin for it, as it were, for the provincial structure. The early medieval texts tell us that these, these provincial centres were deserted in the 8th and 9th century, but in fact, as the archaeology shows, there were, were still centres of activity. Munster, there is absolutely no evidence that it was ever a unified single provincial entity much before the, the sort of 8th century. Um, and Cashel, in that respect, as the sort of provincial capital of Munster, is really the, the problematic one in the bunch, in the bunch of six there. Um, so, the other major so-called provincial centres are united by a sort of monumental iconography that has its sort of origins or genesis in, in the, essentially the Iron Age, really. Um, but Cashel is very different, and not just because there's a big 13th century cathedral stuck on the, the top of it. It's a very, very different landscape. Um, so if Cashel isn't a prehistoric centre, you know, what, what is it? Um, so this is just some geophysics of Cashel, and I won't really go into this in any detail, um, but just suffice to say that after 11 kilometres squared of LIDAR analysis and 16 hectares of geophysical survey, which highlighted, you know, very complex, multi-period landscape, there's not a single bit of evidence for anything that looks like a prehistoric monument. So this is pretty definitive in, in a way, you know, we, don't, we, we simply don't have a prehistory at the Rock of Cashel in any great detail t to speak of. Um, and this is sort of borne out really when you look at um, evidence for in the, the start of the early medieval period, Cashel was sort of the centre of a regional polity but not a sort of provincial polity in the sense of Munster and it was it was actually preceded as the seat of that polity by a centre in, in East Limerick, um, Nakaini. Um, and this is just a LIDAR model of, of Nakaini. I'll sort of skip through this because there's just one or two points that are really important. But this is a really complex, um, multi-period landscape centering, a ritual landscape centered on the hill of Nakaini. And it stretches back in importance, at least as far as the, the Neolithic. Um, this center in, of Nakaini in, in Limerick is, is much more comparable to somewhere like Tara in an archaeological sense. It has two cursus monuments, a host of barrows, and a host of other things that really makes it a, a very complex, multi-period pre historic landscape. Um, that's just zooming in on the, the eastern summit, which is a sort of ritual focus in, the, the, in later prehistory. Um, there's a sort of string of barrows overlying a cursus on the top of the hill. Um, and the centre, just, in the top, just off to the top right, is a, a big cairn, which is contained in a, in a rectangular enclosure. Um, but the, important of, of this really, the, the importance of Nakaini is really borne out more so by some geophysical survey. And despite the fact that the geology kind of played havoc with the, the survey, and most of this isn't actually archaeology, it's just the, the geology. Um, so, some very interesting things that did show up um, is things like a, a, what seems to be a timber henge around the cairn on the top of the hill, um, and that's con concentric with the, the sort of sub-rectangular enclosure around that cairn, but as well a, a, a figure of eight structure, which is just this um, sort of green looking thing there in the bottom corner. But this is really significant because this is a type of essentially temple architecture found at a very select group of sites in Ireland like Dunalnia and Awanmaka, the major provincial centres. And this is seen to be the characteristic of a provincial a prehistoric royal landscape. So the fact that we can find one of these structures at a place which has never recorded provincial status really shows that that provincial structure needs to go. We have to develop a new way of, of looking at these, these landscapes. So you can't just replace a cashel with Nakaini and Munster's sense as a prehistoric uh, 
ritual landscape and say that the provincial structure is, is prehistoric in origins. I think we need to look to the early medieval period for, for how that structure developed in the, the, the medieval period. Um, so sort of the key to doing that is looking at the, the dynasties of early medieval Ireland and what they actually, how, how they actually came about. Um, so traditionally, we would have thought that the, di the major dynasties of early medieval Ireland, like the Inel and the Oganacta, that these were federations of um, biologically related dynasties who traced descent to an actual common ancestor in the 5th century, like Niall Nigelach or Conal Kirk in the Oganacts case. Um, but really, as recently, historians have begun to question this. And actually, what they tend to emphasize now is the fact that these dynastic federations are actually groups of disparate, unrelated peoples or regional polities which were joined together. Um, so th the language of consanguinity or the language of kinship expressed political alignment as opposed to an actual biological relationship. And that's, I think, that's something that you find elsewhere in sort of post-Roman Europe. Um, but it's important in an Irish context because it resituates the development of these major dynastic federations from the 5th and 6th century into the 7th century in Ireland. And that's a very different archaeological landscape than fifth and six, the 5th and 6th century period. So, for instance, um, it resituates the genesis of these major dynastic federations into the same period in which the law tracts are being compiled in Ireland. So we have the largest corpus of vernacular law tracts in anywhere in Europe in, in early medieval Ireland. They were all compiled more or less between 650 and 750 AD. And recently, legal historians have begun to emphasize that these aren't actually codifying an already existent hierarchy and structure, and um, the sort of quintessential Celtic characteristic of Ireland. They're actually implicated in creating that, that hierarchy and curializing the practice of law. So bringing the practice of law into a defined judicial sphere controlled by, by the elite. And so it's no coincidence then that in the 8th century, we see um, two legal traditions emerge in Ireland, the Breton Yeved tradition and the Shanachas Mor, which has a north and south focus, which reflects the major two spheres of political influence in Ireland, that of the Oganacta and, and, and the Enail. So I think we have here the sort of creation of hierarchies. And when, with all the excavations recently in Ireland as a part of the, the sort of Celtic Tiger boom years, we begin to, to see an actual um, an actual settlement hierarchy emerging as well. But this again has a chronological distinction um, in, t in terms of the fact that uh, we have 40,000 ring forts in Ireland, you know, very important um, settlement archaeology, but it has a clear hierarchy in terms of the valation or the, the, the amount of enclosures around these ring forts. So you have the univalid sites on the bottom, which are 7th century, multivalid ring forts, which are 6th to early 7th century in the middle, and then these very large multivalid ring forts, which are 5th to, to 6th century. But these ones on the top, the large multivalid sites, are actually concentrated at, at royal sites. And they've, they've been argued to be sort of sacral in a way. Um, so really what we have in the development of the settlement hierarchy that, we, that sort of characterizes Ireland, and its development and emergence in the 5th and 7th century, really um, is, is, is not just the codification of, again, an existing hierarchy, but the creation of a hierarchy associated, I would argue, with the, the genesis of these, these major dynastic federations which, which control Ireland. And um, so that's a sort of wider important context to looking at the development of, of royal sites in, in this period. Um, and just to t t take the, the issue of assembly particularly, um, the sort of equivalent of the moot or, or ting in Ireland is, is the Enoch. Um, this was essentially the preeminent assembly of each kingdom or each level of polity in early medieval Ireland. And in common with, with other sorts of assemblies throughout northwestern Europe, um, it's a sort of venue for rendering and redistributing tribute. It was a venue for law courts, it's associated with feasting and entertainment. But above all, it's actually associated with horse and, and, and chariot racing. And that's a sort of, you know, taken to be sort of quintessentially Irish characteristic in a way, and sort of some people have connected it to this sort of Indo-European horse ideology of sort of sacred rulership. And, you know, while that's all well and good, and we can, we can debate it if we want, I think it's kind of hard to disassociate that association with horse and chariot racing with things like the Hippodrome in Constantinople and the rituals associated with the Imperial Circus um, in, in the late Roman and early Byzantine Empire. Um, but this is sort of borne out in a way by the fact that um, the language of assembly in sort of 7th to 9th century texts in Ireland actually explicitly equates the Irish assembly practice with classical civic culture. So they use terms like circus, agon, theatrum and spectaculum in place of Enoch. 
um, from at least the, the seventh century. And it would be easy again to sort of argue that this is sort of later emulation of assembly practices which you see elsewhere in Europe if it weren't for the fact that it's so early in an Irish context and for the fact that some of the major assembly landscapes of early medieval Ireland have a large amount of Roman material from them. And this is the example of Aina Clotter there, which is a, a sort of a LIDAR model of it. And just beside this, where this LIDAR is, there's one of the largest hordes of Roman material um, from Ireland. Um, so this is, this is really, you know, a sort of, again, a sort of late an antique context for sort of 5th to 7th century civic society in early medieval Ireland. Um, but again, a sort of wider context of assembly landscapes in Ireland is in association with, with, with burial places. So it seems that actually burial places were, were, were used for assembly in early medieval Ireland. And um, there's a specific association between sites that have been recently, ex recently come to light in excavation, which are known as cemetery settlements or settlement cemeteries. And what these essentially were is locations of burial which are associated with large scale evidence for feasting, craft and, craft and uh, crop processing, uh, craft and metalworking. Um, and essentially what these are, they seem to be sort of local tuhar or sort of kin group places of, of assembly. Um, and that's borne out by a sort of general correlation between these sites in Ireland and documented uh, places, places of assembly. So just to give you one particular example, is the example of Aenoch Carmen, which is sort of the major assembly of the, the province of, of, of Leinster. Um, this has a number of these cemetery settlements or burial places associated with it, but they cluster around the boundaries of this landscape. So you've Corbally, which you've the plan of there on screen, Mullacash, Green Hills, and just at Cocklands Town there, there's a, there's a cemetery as well, which I haven't marked on the, the map. And these cemeteries are all 5th to 7th century, and all within about 500 metres of the boundary of the royal estate associated with, um, with the assembly landscape of Aina Carmen. Um, so this is, this is you know, quite a, a striking correlation. But importantly, the burial in, the, in these complexes is 5th to 7th century, but activity at the sites continue into the 9th and 10th century, and in some cases slightly later. So this supports the identification of the, these as local assembly places, but also the fact that they cluster together within assembly landscapes suggests that they're also assembly places. And we can actually associate some of them with named kin groups. So for instance, Mullacash was the, the capital or assembly place of the, the Langany, a branch of the Berka. And I'll come back to that point later. That's, qu that's quite an important sort of uh, issue with these landscapes. But more generally, aside from the correlation between major assembly landscapes and places of burial utilized for local assembly, is the fact that they're commonly associated with uh, an early medieval church, and particularly conversion period churches. Um, of, we'll say, 115 assembly landscapes which I've documented in Ireland, 40 are associated with a, a Downock type church. And this is particularly significant because Downock churches are the earliest form of church in early medieval Ireland. And the word Downock comes from the Latin Dominicum, and it seems to have been a toponym that went, went out of use by the, the end of the, the sixth century, essentially. Um, and the, the sort of formula of the names of these Downock churches associates them with particular kin groups and particular regional areas. So these have a sort of an administrative and pastoral function. Um, but I think that the correlation of 5th to 7th century burial places, 5th to 6th century church sites, and documented royal assembly landscapes suggest that the assembly function of these landscapes is at least 5th to 6th century in origin in Ireland. Um, and that's, that's quite a significant fact. Um, or I suppose not so much a fact, but an argument, really. Um, but I think one of the, the, the sort of what this, this allows us to, to look at royal landscapes more generally is the fact that when you have these burial sites of the 5th, 6th and 7th century associated with conversion period churches, I think it's appropriate to see the advent of east-west extended burial in these landscapes as associated with the Christianization or, or conversion of these landscapes and their associated polities. Um, so this, this act of burial on the boundaries of these landscapes is emerging within a Christianizing, a Christianizing context. Um, and that's important because in general, um, the, 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 these burials in 5th, 6th, and 7th century contexts have not, seen to be, have not been seen to be Christian in Ireland. It's been argued that these weren't Christian burials until the, the 8th century in Ireland when the church legislated for proper Christian burial. Um, but, so the, the argument goes that it, from the 8th century, these ancestral burial places and local assembly places were abandoned, 
um, in favour of churchyard burial, but this isn't actually the case. Many remained centres of burial in the 9th, 10th and 11th century. Um, so what does that really say about royal landscapes and assembly structures more broadly? I think if we reframe the question, we get a slightly different different perspective. If we ask when these, these sort of kin group burial and assembly places stopped being founded, virtually none are really founded uh, in the 8th century or later. Um, so really what that says is that kin groups were not manufacturing their sort of local kin-based identity through the act of burial in an assembly place. And that's an, a ver very important insight into the nature of these, these landscapes. And of course, that sort of drop-off in the foundation of these, the, these local assembly places is contemporary with the sort of genesis of these major dynastic federations and the first form of evidence we have for the, the existence of a sort of provincial consciousness or the creation of provinces in Ireland. So I think, I don't know why that picture is there in the bottom right. I haven't seen that before, ever. <laughs> um, but I think when we look at these, these major provincial landscapes or the provincial capitals like Awan Maka, Rathcrotton or Donalnya, the fact that recently we've recognised early medieval archaeological evidence from these landscapes and the fact that those particular three examples are documented as places of Enig, I think we've really misunderstood them. They're not centres of ceremony and inauguration necessarily in the early medieval period, but centres of assembly. And we need to assign um, their role as provincial sites to the early medieval period. So that is, they're, uh, they're becoming provincial centres because of the role they played within polities in the early medieval period. So they're, they're sort of emerging as provincial capitals in the, the 8th century, I, I would suggest. Um, and if we look at the example of Leinster, um, it's important to note that in a Carmen, which I uh, had an example of there uh, a few minutes ago, is actually only a couple of kilometres uh, northeast of Dunalnia, the supposed prehistoric capital of Leinster. And while this is seen to be a sort of pre prehistoric um, site, it's actually um, one which stretched into the, the, the 7th and 8th centuries. And the first uh, reference to Carmen in the, the, the annals is actually contemporary with the last reference to Dunalnia in the in the, the annals as well. So it seems that there's a, a sort of shift um, from, it, from uh, th these two sites, but they're part of a single landscape, a sort of broad uh, se central place associated with the creation of a sort of province of Leinster. And that's important because the fall off in burial in, in a Carmen in the seventh century is contemporary with um, the, the emergence and ascendance of the group who are associated with the, the development of an idea of a province of, of Leinster. And we see a similar sort of example in the case of, of Nina. This was the assembly place of East Munster, so a district within the province of Munster. Um, and really what we have in Munster is the creation of a sort of hierarchical structure of administrative jurisdictions, um, sort of East Munster, West Munster, North Munster and South Munster. And Nina was the assembly place for the district of, of East Munster. Um, but again, we have the same, same sort of archaeology, 5th to 8th century burial place associated with sort of feasting evidence, crop, proce crop processing, craft working. But that burial site of Carrigator Harding there in the bottom left falls out of use in the 8th century and activity shifts to the, the sort of mound there in the top right, which is Tullahidi. The important point is that this is actually a natural knoll, but in the 8th century this was converted into a mound by the digging of a ditch around the, the, the knoll. And what this actually seems to have been was the creation of an assembly mound. The townland Tullahidi, I, I would suggest, probably derives from Tullach Teda, and Teda was the, the sort of mythical ancestress associated with the assembly of East Munster. The original name of Enoch Uruven, or in the assembly of East Munster, was Enoch Teda. So this is a sort of the mythologization of assembly landscapes associated with the sort of creation of origin myths, which unified different peoples. And we see this expressed in assembly landscapes through the actual the cessation of burial in ancestral burial places, even though they continued to be local assembly places, they just stopped have, having a burial function. And I think what, what we're seeing here is a sort of the formation of law provinces in a way, where we have contemporary with the, all these developments, the promulgation of laws over these certain nascent provincial kingdoms of Munster, Leinster and, and so on. And it's appropriate that the earliest actual example of a, a coin or a law promulgated by a king in Ireland is actually associated with the creation of the Ogonacht Federation and the sort of genesis of a, a provincial kingship for the, the, the kingship of, of, of Cashel. Um, and associated with these sort of developments, we also have the use of these promulgation of these laws 
as sort of inauguration venues. So in the case of Rat Crotton and in Munster, we have evidence for the actual promulgation of laws over certain nascent provinces at the same time as kings are uh, elevated or inaugurated through the act of uh, acclamation in an assembly. So this isn't exactly a sort of complex ceremony and procession of inauguration as we'd be used to thinking of the, these landscapes, but the sort of use of inauguration through, through assembly. Um, and Rat Crotton is a really, really good example of that. And so, sort of, finally, just to, to, to sum up, I think what, what we see in these these landscapes is a sort of territorialization of kingship and the scales of identity that uh, assembly landscapes were, were constructing. So far from constructing a sort of localized uh, sort of identity of a kin group, these were constructing sort of um, almost generic sort of territorial identities, the sort of provincial identities. And we see this in the actual transformation of these places of local assembly into centers of, of, of kingship and tribute for regional kingdoms. So local assembly places from the 8th and 9th century started to become centers of a sort of villa regalis system or a structure of, of of um, royal centres to which tribute was paid. And we see this, this manifest in the archaeology of these landscapes through concentrations of things like souterrains, which were used for, for storing food. So these are sort of centres of redistributive systems of tribute and render in, from the 8th, 8th to 9th century onwards. And also in the, the ceremony of inauguration of, of the major kingships of, of Tara and Cashel. So in the case of Tara and Cashel, we can actually trace the ceremony of inauguration for these landscapes over the course of maybe six, seven, kilometers, so very protracted large-scale ceremonies. But when you contrast this with the fact that there's only really evidence for explicit protracted inauguration ceremonies for Tara and Cashel, there's not really for any other kingship of early medieval Ireland. I think th th these, are, these are very significant differences between the sort of provincial and large-scale kingships in Ireland. Um, but what we actually have in the, these sort of large-scale protracted ceremonies is a sort of polysemic ceremony. So they can, they can be used, if you want, in a sort of traditional understanding of Irish kingship to look for a sort of union of a king and a goddess. But they also seem to emphasize telok, which was a legal ritual for taking possession of land. And in Cashel's case, this is performed on a monumental scale um, through the actual procession through the landscape. There's three stages of the telok ritual, and those three stages are alluded to and mimicked in the actual inauguration process. Procession. So I think what this is, is the, is the transformation of these kingships and the, the territories for which they're, 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 they're controlling into, uh, into territorial entities as opposed to amalgamations of people and, and, and dynasties. Um, so it's a sort of territorial authority based more on sovereignty than, than suzerainty. Um, so really, I suppose, it, it, sort of, it brings Irish kingship in a way into a sort of, the, the sort of general narrative of, of European kingship. There's, there's actually many similarities between king, the development of kingship in Ireland and the role of royal landscapes um, with other areas of a sort of northwestern Europe that haven't really been appreciated because we've seen these landscapes as sort of archaic and sort of Celtic and look to the ceremonial element at the expense of their sort of role in the practice of, of, of these kingdoms. So I'll leave it at that and that's just a list of some people that have helped along the way. So thanks.